Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Robin. Uh, Sharon is over here. We're uh, we're part of the Postdoc Association. So the Postdoc Association is a is a new group on campus uh, that is organized to kind of uh, advocate for postdocs, uh, provide professional and social opportunities for postdocs, and we're going to try to do professional development things like this about once a month. We also do some social activities. We do those about once a month as well. Um, let's see. Uh, if you're interested in hearing uh, or keeping up with what we're doing, uh, you can uh, either contact us at our email address, and that is postdoc at mailbox.sc.edu. Uh, we also have a listserv. I think most of you are probably all on the listserv already, but if you're not, I have a sign-up sheet up here, so you can sign up before you head on out uh, at the end today, and we can add you to that. Um, I've also got a sign-up sheet that I'll pass around. There you go. You can sign in um, just so we can show how many people were here. Um, <clears throat> let's see. We've got some, a lot of events coming up in the next couple weeks. Uh, on Tuesday, over in the PHRC, Public Health Research Center, room 319, we're going to have our first business meeting. And so all the executive committee will be there. Anyone who's interested in participating in the group, you can certainly come to that meeting. It may be kind of boring, but you can also uh, learn about what we plan on doing and uh, kind of shaping what this group becomes. So uh, that is 11.30 on Tuesday in the PHRC. Uh, on Wednesday, a week from today, we're having another social event. We're having happy hour at the Thirsty Fellow. Uh, that's at 5.30. Come on down, uh, drinks are on you, but we'll buy appetizers and things like that. We had a good showing last time we had 25 people or so show up. Uh, so come and uh, meet some other postdocs. And our next professional development uh, event is coming up in uh, less than two weeks. It's a panel discussion on what to expect your first year as a faculty member. Um, I think uh, a lot of people uh, Dr. Han laughs because I know he gets questions all the time from new faculty members uh, about things that, that they wish they would have known before they started. And so we're going to have uh, some panelists from the School of Medicine, um, Biological Sciences, and uh, Epi and Biostats. Going to be here talking about their experiences in their first couple years as faculty members. So that's um, Tuesday, March 4th. Uh, in this building in room 140. And so that's the room right where you walk past it as you came in. So there are lots of flyers up here for that. Uh, so you can take one of those um, on your way out the door as well. Um, let's see. So that's that's the events that we've got coming on. Um, now it's time to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Greg Hand. Dr. Hand is the Associate Dean for Research and Practice. Not sure exactly what that is, but, it, but it's important. Uh, he's also a professor in the exercise science department. Uh, he graduated from University of South Carolina with his bachelor's degree and an MPH. Um, he got his PhD from UT Southwestern and he was a postdoc at UT Southwestern with uh, Jerry Mitchell who was one of the real pioneers in understanding the neural control of blood pressure and heart rate. Um, so he, he has a great background and has experiences as a postdoc. In addition, he's been on both sides of the negotiating table, uh, either for a job or interviewing or negotiating with potential hirees. So he's got lots of great information for us. Um, today's uh, seminar is going to be an open forum. So if he has some things, you can talk about those to begin with. Otherwise, we can just ask questions. I've got some questions. So welcome, Dr. Hayden. Thanks. How many people here are in the School of Public Health? So there are a few people from, what units are you from? From the Department of Psychology. Psychology? Yeah. So arts and sciences? Arts and sciences, yeah. Are most of you from arts and sciences that aren't from okay. Most of you from psychology? No. no. <laughs> Where are you from? Physics. Geography in the back. Right. Geography in the back. All right, so Robin asked me today to talk about, well, I think it was probably because he saw me talking to somebody else about this one day, but he asked me to talk about how to negotiate the first job. And let me start off by saying you've already started negotiating your first job. You just don't know it yet. You started negotiating your first job the day that you signed on to an undergraduate degree somewhere. The 
because your CV is, is going to be you. It represents you. That's what, and I'm telling you this from the perception of the other side of the table, because I I've done a lot of searches for all the levels. And if you're looking for a if you're looking for a new faculty member at assistant professor level, the CV is really what you have. You're going to see what's going to happen is that somebody's going to bring a stack of applications for the search committee, and the search committee is going to look through it. They're going to see a letter. They're going to see a letter of application, and they're going to see a CV, and then they're going to see a list of names. And that's the first cut. So if your letter or your CV is not what they're looking for, it doesn't go any farther. It goes over to the other file. And it's never never spoken of again. Right. So your CV is very important. And your CV really starts with where you got your undergraduate degree. Because pedigree does matter. You hear people say pedigree doesn't matter. It, this is simply not true. It doesn't matter as much as it used to. It matters much more now what you've done. But you're working for your CV. Because your CV is really the currency for jobs. Okay. So let me start off by saying that. So my, my perspective on this that I'm giving you is from the other side of the table. It's the person who's looking for an assistant professor, a new assistant professor, which I assume most of you would be looking for. All right, so Robin saw, saw me draw this one day, and this is, this is really what I tell students and postdocs who are looking for a job. If you think about a, a university in terms of the infrastructure that it has and the expectation that it has of its faculty. You're going to end up with four quadrants. You're going to end up with low infrastructure and low expectations. Are there institutions like that? Sure. Tech schools, um, teaching colleges. Now think about this in terms of a research institution. If you're, a, if you're doing a postdoc, I assume that you're interested in pursuing <laughs> research either in, in, in industry, in government, or in a university setting. Low infrastructure, low expectation, tech schools, teaching institutions, things like that. And I will tell you up front, when I finished my doctoral degree, I never wanted to do another experiment for the rest of my life. It actually started applying for jobs at teaching institutions. And there was one teaching institution that I applied at where the, the chair of the department talked to me on the phone. There, and the, the smaller schools have a very different process of, uh, of hiring than the bigger institutions do. But, I talked to the chair at a meeting. This was one of those where you go and you could sign up for people who are interested in hiring. And she and I got along great. And then I talked to her on the phone later, and she got a group uh, search committee together, so to speak. But it was very informal to talk to me on the phone. And that went well for about an hour. And she asked me, and of course, I never saw the people on the phone. And she said, is there anybody else who has a question for Greg? And there was this old semi-retired faculty member who was on the search committee for biology who said, Greg, I'm sitting here looking at your CV and I just have one question, which is why are you applying at a place like this? And I just told him, I said, I was very interested in teaching and I'd done a lot of research, had a bunch of publications, was in a very productive group, very well-known place, but it just really wasn't, wasn't what I wanted to do. And his response was, no, it is what you want to do, you're just tired. And he told me, he said, you know, you're going to be, you're, you would come here for a year and then you would be looking for a new job. And I never heard from the group again. And they hired somebody else. Um, and he was, at, looking back on it, he was absolutely right. I'd have been there about a year and then I'd have, you know, had itchy feet. I'd have been looking for something else. So, but these, you know, if, if you're really interested in teaching, working with students, you know, you really don't want to fight for grants and, you, you know, you don't want to do that stuff and you find that you're being drawn the other way, there are places like this. And they're not bad places. You know, there are some outstanding places. If you have a postdoc, you're going to be competitive here. 20 years ago, you would not have been. They wouldn't have touched you with a 10-foot pole. But if you've got a postdoc now, you've got publications, you've got what postdocs are supposed to have on their CV, many of these kinds of schools are very interested now. Then we have <coughs> high infrastructure, high expectations. Research One institutions, AAU institutions, the big research institutions, academic health centers, those are these kind of places where they have high expectations. You're supposed to bring in a percentage of your money, and that's something you need to talk about. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but that's something certainly you need to talk about and negotiate for. Many institutions expect you to generate X percentage of your salary. The salaries are higher, but you have to pay yourself. So those are the kinds of things we'll talk about, but you need to know about those. 
it's not unusual at all for an institution to expect you to pay yourself 25% of your salary. That's, that's almost the bottom end of many institutions. Some Southwestern Medical Center, when I was there, expected you to pay 50 to 60% of your salary. But they have really high salaries. Then you have high infrastructure, low expectation. Ha ha, yeah, like that ever exists. You know, I have people tell me all the time, Greg, I really like doing research, but I don't want to have to write grants. And my response is, if you don't want to write grants, you're not going to be doing research for a while because you got to pay for it. So unless you're in a field, if you're in physics, you know, you better have some money because if the institution is going to invest in you the million dollars probably over the first five or six years in terms of space, you know, wet lab space is almost seven times the cost of dry lab and office space per square foot. You know, pieces of equipment, we know what the cost of equipment are. They're, they're through the ceiling. Anything that's related to academics or anything that's related to medicine is going to be five times what it ought to cost. So any institution that's going to invest in you, not in salary, not in benefits, but in space and in equipment, they're going to have expectations and they're probably going to be high expectations. This just simply doesn't exist. I mean, how could it? Right? They wouldn't be around very long. It's not a business model anymore. Okay. And then we have low infrastructure, high expectation. These do exist, and you want to avoid these like the plague. And I'll tell you a recent one. I had a former student who had applied for a job. This happened about two weeks ago, and called me and said he was really nervous about the position. And I asked him why, and he said because they were expecting two papers a year from him. And I said, what's wrong with that? He said, they want me to teach a 4-3, which means four courses one semester, three courses the next semester. That's this. And they are out there, and there are a lot of them. And a lot of the institutions that are 4-4s four and 4-3s, four and even 3-2s, are now expecting people to do research because they think you make a lot of money if you do research. They see the newspaper where somebody brought in four or five million dollars in research funding, so all these little institutions now want you to do research. The only problem is they don't understand that research actually costs money. You, don't, it's, you lose money doing research. You don't make money doing research. But the expectation is happening. This is going on right now down in Charleston with the College of Charleston and the Medical University of South Carolina where there's a lot of talk about them merging. People at the College of Charleston are terrified. They're teaching four twos and four threes, and now they're being told we're going to merge with a, with a medical institution, so research productivity is going to be expected. When? So this is my graphic I always show. As long as you're on this line and you know what you're getting into, you're okay. When you start deviating from this line one way or the other, you can't really deviate that way because it doesn't really exist. Don't deviate this way. This is a bad situation to be in. You know, if you want to be in a place where you're dealing with students a lot and you're really involved with students and like doing advising and teaching and doing those things, go to a place where the infrastructure and the expectation is balanced. And there are a lot of those around. All right? So I say that up front. Know what you want. Know yourself. Know what you like. Know what you want to do. And, and apply to institutions that represent that. What I see a lot are people who would just apply for everything. They apply at an AAU institution. Everybody know what an AAU institution is? It's basically the top 60 research institutions in the field. Right. American Association of Universities. There are really high standards, high criteria to get in for that. Yeah, I think it's, there may be 63 of them. So there are people who are applying to AAU institutions and applying to tech schools at the same time. And that just tells me that the person doesn't really know what they want. And it, it gets dangerous because obviously if you want to do high level research, expensive research, you want to be applying at AAU institutions. And if you don't want to do that stuff, you're going to be applying at the tech school level. But if you're applying for both, it makes you nervous. So know what you want and do your homework on the institutions. You know, the Chronicle of Higher Education does an almanac every year that has all kinds of stuff about institutions. It's got salaries. It's got where they rank on different levels. Um, Arizona State University I think has an online database that isn't quite as good as, as the Chronicle of Higher Education, but they also, they also track salaries of faculty. The AAUP, the American Association of University Professors, has a very good chronicle 
uh, of, of, of salaries and those types of things. So those are three places where you can start looking around. All right. Also know what type of unit that your department will be in. And I will use the example of exercise science since that's the one I'm in. There are many exercise science departments that are in colleges of education. There are some that are in colleges of arts and sciences or science and math, depending on the name of the unit. There are some that are in schools of public health, like the one here. And then there are some that are in schools of public health that are affiliated with an academic health center, school of medicine, basically, and hospitals. As you go through that hierarchy, the salaries go up dramatically. You know, someone who's here in the School of Public Health and Exercise Science that would be doing the same thing somewhere else in College of Education is going to make more here. So it's important not only to know the institution, but also know the unit that the department is in. Because it matters a lot. <coughs> so let's say you've got a good CV, you've got a good letter together, and I hope when you write letters that they are specific to that institution. Um, this is backing up before the negotiation, but I do want to say this. Your letter of application should follow what's written in the advertisement. It should be point for point. When, when you look at an advertisement, it's going to say these are the qualifications we want, and these are the activities that are going to happen if you get hired here. Your letter of application should follow that almost word for word. We want someone with a doctoral degree of postdoc experience. In your letter, you say, I'm a PhD from this place, and here's where I completed my postdoc. They're going to say, you know, has an established record or establishing a record of scientific productivity. I've got this many publications. I've been on these grants. I'm doing this, blah, blah, blah. And you just go down the line. That's going to help you a lot. And as someone who looks through a lot of applications and layers of application, Boy, I mean, you just rise. You are the cream if you do that. If you write one of these seven-page meandering narratives about yourself and why you decided to get a degree, oh my goodness, don't do that. You know? Do bullet points. That's even better. You want this? Here's what I did. You want this? Here's what I did. Now, of course, if you don't have half of the stuff in there, it's hard to do that. And so usually that's when you start writing these meandering letters of application. And of course, after you've been on many search committees, you realize that's what's going on. So if you've got it, if you really meet the criteria for that job, just nail it in your letter. And it will move you up dramatically on the list of potential applicants, potential candidates. All right, so you go, and the I was given a list of negotiating questions. And some of the questions are things like, how will I be interviewed, and those kinds of things. So those are questions before the negotiation. So let me say a lot of, a lot of how, when, when you apply for a job, how you are treated as a candidate, a lot of it depends on the institution, a lot of it depends on the culture of the type of job it is, whether it's physics or business or, or school of public health, those kinds of things matter. In general, what happens now is that you will get a phone call from the chair of the search committee saying they're interested in you and they want to do a phone interview. And the phone interview will be you sitting there on the phone talking to the talking to the search committee. And if it's anything like here, it probably won't be all the members of the search committee because it's hard getting faculty in the all in the room at the same time. But that's okay. And they're going to ask you questions that you should be thinking about yourself. Because keep in mind, they're wanting someone who can do the job, but they're also wanting someone who's going to be a good colleague and someone they like. So they're going to ask you questions like, tell us about your strengths and weaknesses. You know, strengths are great. Everybody knows their strengths. Boy, sometimes you ask people their weaknesses, and they just fall apart. So and I will, I will simply say, you, you don't want to be manipulative when you answer questions like that. But it's always relatively easy to turn a weakness into a strength. And you want to do that. You want to be honest and say, you know what, I have this shortcoming, but I've really been working on it in these ways, and here are some examples of ways that I've really improved that. You know, so there, there are things you can do. There are ways that you can present things. Never present things in the negative. I had a student, a postdoc not too long ago, who was looking for jobs, and he did very well at getting on-site interviews. He would, do the, he would do the phone interviews, do great, go to the on-site interviews, and never get a job off. 
And so I asked him one day, I said, why don't we sit down and do just a mock interview and let's see what happens. And I would ask him questions that I often ask people on, on, on searches, and he would start off great, but he would finish every single answer with a negative sentence. I've been doing this for the last three years. I've been running an NIH grant. We generated this data. It was two sites, and I managed the whole thing, blah, 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 blah. But we had 25% drawback. Every single answer ended with a negative. Be positive. This is a good thing. You know, it, it's fun to interview. It really is. I think it is. You know, it gives you a chance to meet people. It gives you a chance to get your name out. And I will tell you, I know people who have been contacted by institutions because they applied somewhere else. And somebody at the other place called somebody they know and said, we aren't going to hire this person, but they're really good. They were our number two. And they get a phone call. So that happens. So it's a way to get your name out. And for postdocs, you know, when people are asking, asking individuals to come give presentations, they kind of go down the list. And postdocs are usually pretty far down the list. You don't get a chance to go to an institution that doesn't know you and give a presentation very often. So it's an opportunity for you to do that. So let's say that you put in a great application, that you nailed exactly what they're looking for, your CV looks great, you do a phone interview, it goes great, the chair of the committee is going to call back and say, we want to bring you to campus. They're usually going to bring three or four people to campus, at least for a big institution. They aren't going to tell you who the other ones are. Oftentimes, they will post them on their website. So, so if, you're, if you're cool with that, go see who your competition is. If you get really nervous, don't. And if you're one of these people that tends to compare yourself to other people and find, you know, focuses on your own flaws, don't go see who your competition is. Because you will just psych yourself out going, well, God, look at his CV and I don't have that. Don't do that. You know? So, let's say you get in invited to, and you come, you do the on-site interview. It's probably going to be two days, and there's, it's two days for a reason. Because many times, after a day and a half of you saying the same thing, you start getting tired and you start saying things you didn't say before. So, you know, it's a torture test and it's supposed to be two days interviews. The, the second half of the second day is always horrible. Because you said the same thing to 20 different people in multiple groups. But I will tell you, the search committee will get together and they will talk about your answers. And I have been in many a search committee meeting where they said, well, wait a minute, they told me this, but they told you that. And then my doctoral student who walked them across campus, who was grilling them as they were walking across campus, or my administrative assistant who drove them back to the airport, who was asking them questions that they didn't realize they were still being interviewed, they told her something completely different. So when you step off of that plane to go do your on-site interview, have your story straight and say the same thing. Don't deviate. Say the same thing over and over and over again. Just because that's part of the torture test. One of the questions that was asked was, will I be asked to give a presentation? And the answer is yes. And the second part of that question was, what should I present? And the answer is, number one, your best work. And number two, and this is critically important, something that you know about. Don't go somewhere and present something that you don't see yourself as being an expert in. Because there's nothing worse than standing up in front of a group, especially when it's a job interview, and not coming off as the smartest person in the room on that topic. And I say on that topic because you will never in your life be in a room where you know more than everybody else in the room about everything. But whatever you're presenting, know everything there is to know about that. And you will probably have an old curmudgeon in the room like me who challenges you on something. And oftentimes those guys are actually put in the room because they'll do that. And they'll challenge you. So know what you're talking about. Present your best work and know what you're talking about. And everybody you talk to is interviewing you, even if it's the administrative assistant who's walking you across campus or you're sitting there eating lunch, usually a pizza lunch with students. Everybody who you talk to when you step off that plane is interviewing you. And everybody who you talk to is going to ask for input about you. So stay on message. Can't emphasize that enough. Stay on message. So you have a good two days. You fly out. You get back home. And then you start waiting. Right? But you have a lot of things to do while you're waiting. And the things that you have to do are, first of all, start looking at that institution about all the things you didn't have time to look at before the interview. 
know everything there is to know about that institution. Start making a list, go through your labs, especially if you're a wet lab person, go through the lab and make a list of everything in that lab that you have ever fluoride on the shelf. Write down everything. Equipment, if it's not in your lab, but you use a piece of equipment regularly or even infrequently, write it down. So that if you get a job offer, you can go back to the chair of the search committee and say, this is what I need. Right? So it's important to have those things. It's important to know exactly what you need. If you want to replicate your work somewhere else, you need to know exactly what it's going to take in terms of supplies and equipment to do that. So while you're doing that, you get a phone call, usually from the chair of the department. It won't be from the chair of the search committee, probably. It may be from the dean offering you a job. And they're going to say, well, you're our number one choice, which is what they'll always tell you whether you were or not. <laughs> and we really want you to come here. We think you'd fit in great. You're going to add a lot. There's going to be a great relationship with everybody. If we really see you moving us forward, we think we can help you move forward. Too. So the person says that, the chair says that, then you're on the phone and you're going, what do I say back? And you say, well, let's talk. If, if, if that's all they say, they'll usually say more. Well, that's all they say. You say, well, can we talk a little bit about the specifics? And so the reason you're here today is you want to know what the specifics are. So let me tell you some specifics. And the first one everybody wants to think about is salary. And here's my answer to negotiating salary. Whatever they offer, ask for more. Because they are not going to offer you everything they have. There are no faculty in here, are there? Like Dean's not sitting in the back of the room. Thank you, They're never going to offer you what they have. Most institutions, if they're, at least if they're state-supported institutions, they actually have what are called bands. And these are ranges of salary. And if you're faculty, usually the state will give you some leeway in terms of that band. The problem with that is, if you're an administrator, if if I, have, if I have associate professors who are making $80,000 a year, and I'm throwing these numbers out, don't write these numbers down because they're meaningless other than just they're easy for me to remember. If I've got an associate professors who are making $80,000 a year, I can't bring a new assistant professor in at $80,000. If I do, the next thing I've got are all the associate professors, and people know what your salary is. I'll have so every one of the associate professors will be in my office screaming that they want $85,000. So it's important to know what the ranges are for salaries. And also know that the salary ranges are different depending on where you are in the United States. The Southeast, the salary ranges are lower. The cost of living is lower. So it's important to do your homework. And those websites I talked about before, Chronicle of Higher Education, they have national averages and they split them out by doctoral institutions, you know, undergraduate institutions. They split them out that way. Most of these places do. The AAUP splits out like that. So it's important to have a good idea of what a reasonable range would be by where you are. Private institutions will offer more money. Or let me change that. Private institutions have more money. They have more freedom. I'm not saying they're going to offer you more. But whatever they offer you, know that it's not the most that they'll be comfortable paying. And let me back up just a little bit. When they call you and make you the offer, don't say yes, okay? Right. You need time to think about this. You need other details. The thing to ask for, if this is within any, any kind of, you know, at that point you may decide you don't want to go there. And you need to be up front and tell them that. But if somebody calls and makes you an offer, the first thing you should say is how enthusiastic you are about it and that you're still very interested, but you'd like to come back for a second. And most institutions that you want to work at, at least that I would want to work with, that app, will say okay. Now here's a little tidbit. If you negotiate first and you settle on something and you send a letter back, and all this has to be written, right? You're not going to take people's word for any of this. Right? When you finally get to a point where you negotiate and I'm jumping ahead, when you get to a point where you negotiate it enough, you're happy, you want it writing. I'll tell you how to do that in a, in a professional way. Once they send you something in writing, 
that you have an official offer. What they've said on the phone is meaningless. You have an official offer, and that offer's on the table until you write back and say okay. Once you say okay, it's, it's closed. Once you say okay, if you say I'd like to come back for another look, if the university says, says we'll do that, all of that travel is now taxable to you. You have to pay for taxes on all that travel. So do all your traveling and everything before there's an acceptance of an offer. Then it's on them. Then it's not your problem. So think about taxes and stuff like that. Because you guys, you know, assistant professors aren't the highest paid people on the planet. So taxes and things like that matter. Um, all right, so you've been given an offer. What are you going to ask for? You're going to talk about salary. You want to know about benefits. Benefits are important. Benefits, things like health care, you know, who pays for it, how much of it, you know, what kind of co-payments are there, do they have PPOs, do they have HMOs, you know, what do they have, it, can you go anywhere you want to, if it's, in a, if it's in an academic health center, you're probably, you know, your physician who is, is whoever's in the office next door to you, you can write your prescription. So those, those things are important. Spousal hires, if you have a trailing spouse, that's important to tell them up front because most institutions now, at least most bigger institutions, have some kind of policy about trailing spouses. The most irritating thing on the planet to me is to have gone through negotiations, everything's going great, and then you get a phone call thinking the person's going to accept the job, and they say, I have a, tra I have a trailing spouse. Because all of a sudden, man, you've got to go find jobs for them. And most institutions have policies, but that takes time. You're not doing yourself or anybody any favor by saving that till the end to bring it up. If you have a trailing spouse, if you need some kind of support from the institution from this trailing spouse, even if it's just an office for faculty and postdocs where they can help this person find a job, do that up front. I always ask, when I'm chairing a search, I always ask, the last question I ask on the phone interview, are there any circumstances we need to know about that would affect your hiring at this institution? And oftentimes when I ask that question, somebody will say something like, I have a, I have a, a trailing spouse who's a PhD who has a degree in philosophy. Can we do something for, for him or her? I have five kids does your university have some kind of benefits in terms of reduced tuition for faculty and staff for their kids? Most, most bigger institutions do. The University of South Carolina does not. And I really, I really hate having to say that. Many institutions have reciprocation agreements with other institutions. And there's actually a national network of that now, which we are currently are in the of. But, so not only trailing spouse, but things like tuition waivers for your kids. Now, if you have kids, that's important. We had a faculty member leave here not too long ago and go to a small teaching college because he had five kids. The first one was going to start college in a couple of years, and they were going to waive tuition for all of his kids. You know, this was a private school. This was literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in tuition that he wasn't going to have to pay at a very fine liberal arts college, and he would have had to pay for them if he had stayed here. So that's important. Benefits. Um, health insurance, things, and these are things that you always want to ask a benefits office or a human resource office. So when you're on the phone, when you've been made an offer, one of the things you're going to ask for is can I come back for a second visit? When I come back, I'd like to talk to a real estate agent who can travel, who can ride us around, and you always want to take your spouse when you go back. You want to, you want to meet with a real estate agent who can drive you around, and did I say you want to talk to human resources? You want to talk to human resources. You want to talk to other junior faculty, preferably ones who have only been there two or three years. Talking to somebody like me about what it's like for an assistant professor is pointless. So there are certain people that you want to talk to. There are already online, there are dozens and dozens of cost of living analysis software websites you go to. Go to them. If you're made an offer and it's in at the University of Massachusetts, go look at the cost of living there relative to the cost of living here. I think it would probably blow the top of your head off if you do. 
but don't go to one of those. Go to several of them because you'll get different different numbers. So those are things you want to talk about on the second visit. So what have we learned so far? Number one is don't say, yeah, I'll take the job. Number two is you want to come back. When you go back, you want to have that list of equipment and supplies and everything. You need to have an idea of how much square footage you have. If you have, a, if you have a wet lab, you need to have some idea of the amount of square footage you need to be able to be successful. And that's what all of this is about. You want to be successful wherever you go. And the institution wants you to be successful. So there's no point in going someplace where you're not going to have the resources that you need to be successful. You're not doing them any favor. You're not doing you any favor. In fact, I would say probably up front, after you've been made an offer, tell the chair of the department or the dean, whoever it is, that you want to send this person a list of the equipment supplies you need. Can you have somebody start looking to see what equipment is already available? Because a lot of, especially bigger pieces of equipment, every lab doesn't need a piece of equipment. So you need to know what on the list is available so that you wouldn't have to buy. They will send you back, and they will be happy to do this. They will send you back, here's the list of things that we already have. When you go for your second visit, you want to talk to the, to the people who run the labs that those pieces of equipment are in. Because oftentimes what will happen is a chair of a department will say, sure, we have this piece, this MRI is over here in this center, and you're welcome to use it. And you go talk, when you go back, you go talk to the MRI center director, and they say, yeah, and it's only $450 an hour to use it. So know what you need in terms of resources. Square footage, supplies, equipment, those kinds of things. Give them a chance to see what they already have. But it's your job and your responsibility to make sure that when they tell you they have it, that number one, they do have it, number two, it works, and number three, you do have access to it. All right. Retirement. These sound trivial, don't they? I'm, I'm sure they sound trivial to you, but I'm 57, so they aren't trivial to me at all. Retirement. There are multiple ways that retirement are handled. Some places have state retirement where you give them a certain amount of your salary every year, and they, after five or six years, you invest it in the state system. So when you retire, you get typically half your salary for the rest of your life. More and more institutions are sort of doing away with that and going to what is called an optional retirement program. TIAA CREF is the biggest one. Those are portable retirement programs where you pay a certain percentage of your salary into the retirement program, they invest it for you, and then the institution matches a percentage of it. That match is really important. And I'll give you an example why. University of South Carolina, you pay six to seven percent. Can't remember which one it is. The institution puts in five percent. Go to the University of Tennessee, you put in five percent, they put in ten percent. Over your career, that's a boatload of money. That difference is a boatload of money. It's important when you're talking to human resources or benefits office, whichever one they want to call it. It's important for you to find out how the retirement system works. Here's another thing. Most people, when they go to institutions now and take their first job, they're thinking, I'll be out of there in three to five years. I'll get my first NIH grant. I'll get my, my second R01 in my second year. And then off I go to Harvard. Well, it may happen, unlikely, but it may happen. If it does happen, if you're in the state retirement program, if you've been in there three years, you just lost all the money that was put in that program because it's not portable. So it's important to know how retirement all right, so let me get off the boring stuff and start talking about some stuff you're more interested in. Um, what kind of job is a good fit? All right, so research, teaching, and service expectations. I would say research, teaching, advising, and service expectations. When I came to the University of South Carolina as assistant professor, I had never asked about advisement. And literally, the first week I was there, I walked in one morning, and there were all these students sitting on the floor, lined up down the hallway. And one of them was sitting like right by my door, and I said, what's going on? And she said, we're waiting for you. 
And I said, for what? I mean, I've been there like three days. And she said, we're waiting for you. And I said, for what? She said, you're our advisor. <laughs> I mean, that was my, literally, that was my whole day. Because e almost every one of those students would walk in and I would say, well, what are you taking? Well, this is what I'm taking. Well, what do you want to take? I don't know. <laughs> well, what is, your, what is your schedule? Have you projected out? You know? why, why are you here? Yeah, it, it didn't go well. Let's put it that way. My expectations were much higher than their expectations. Um, so research, teaching, advisement service. Because advisement in certain institutions, if you have a big undergraduate program and you're expected to advise a percentage of those, that's a lot of time. And now when you've got the helicopter parents who want to show up when their kids are getting advised, or they do badly on a test, you have to meet with their parents, which is crazy for me. When I was in college, their parents showed up. It was the most humiliating thing. But now they're all over the place. So research, teaching, advisement, and service. Research, I think we sort of all know what that is. Know what the expectations are. Know the tenure and promotion process. Know the tenure and promotion criteria. Those should be online. Most places you can find tenure and promotion criteria online. That is not trivial. I would, I would say that probably 60 to 70% of the assistant professors that come to the University of South Carolina walk in the door and they don't know what it's going to take to get tenure. And that is a huge mistake. Now, people aren't going to usually give you numbers, but they're going to expect you to have some scholarly activity, some research productivity. If you're in one of the basic sciences or you're in STEM, that expectation is that you're going to write grants and you're going to get funded. If you're not, it may be a certain number of books. The rule used to be we always talk about two for tenure, two papers a year for tenure. If you're in epidemiology, I'll tell you right now, two papers a year is not because epidemiologists should be able to crank out five to ten papers a year at least. If you're a molecular biologist and you just got there, you know, you're looking at a couple papers a year. And those are your papers. Those aren't papers you're fifth out of 14 authors on. You know, be first or last author. And be first author more than last author. Don't come in, hire a whole bunch of students and have them write papers and you be last author because it doesn't look good. It's good to have students, it's good to have a nice mix, but have some papers that you wrote and your first author on at that institution. Also realize that probably the first couple of years, your productivity after a postdoc is going to go down. My first year when I came after the postdoc, I think I published seven papers, and the next year I published two. Because there were a lot of things to do. I mean, it took me six months to get the lab up. So know what the research expectations are. If you're a research one institution or, or an AAU institution, you know, you better be getting grants out the door the first year. You better be hitting on some grants the second year. Because most institutions have what is called a third year review, which is really a second year review because you put this thing together in the second year and you turn it in and they look at it in your third year. And that's the first big cut that you're going to see. That's the first time the institution can really legitimately say, you aren't getting it done. You're going to have to go find someplace else to go. Some institutions are really brutal about that. <coughs> Others are not. But that third year review is really the first, the first cut as a faculty member. So make sure you're being productive at that institution. And this comes back to, you've got to have the resources to do it. If you're there, if you walk in the door and you don't have what you need, you're not going to be productive the first or second year. You know, you're going to have that, that second year to give everybody talks about. So walk in with some stuff in your pocket and have the resources. And again, that comes back to that list of things that you need and making sure that when you walk in the door, that stuff has been ordered or it's already sitting there working and that you have access to it. Teaching. Most larger, most research institutions don't really have a very high teaching load. You know, a lot of places are one one. Mostly, what I hear is one one two two. Two two to me, if you're if you're expected to be a nationally competitive researcher, two two seems a lot to me. Don't quote that around here. I'll get big trouble. You know, two one I think is probably as high as I would, I would expect somebody who's really competitive to be <coughs> to be teaching. You can negotiate your teaching loads. That's the easiest thing to negotiate. 
try and negotiate the lowest teaching load you can for the first couple of years. Oftentimes what you find is that someone will negotiate where they're teaching, they're protected from teaching their first year. And what happens their first year? They spend three or four months getting their lab set up. They finally get a student to walk in the door after the first semester. And by the end of the year, when the next year they're going to be teaching all of a sudden, they're just starting to get productive. I've often told people, negotiate so you're protected the second year. You know, because the first year, at least the first semester you're there, you're not going to be up and running as a scientist. But you can negotiate those things. Make sure you try and get some protected time. Someone, they may say, you know, we can't give you a year off of teaching. Then get the minimum you can get. Try and get one course. You know, at worst, get one course per semester. And if you can, negotiate that those are the courses you'll teach for the next at least three years. Because what kills your productivity in the first few years is prepping for new classes. And I've had former students who went off to teaching institutions who had one or two new preps every semester for the first two or three years. And that just crushes your productivity. So negotiate the teaching part hard. Now, you're not going to do this when you're on the phone with that first call, right? This is after you said, you know, can I come back for a second visit? You know, how much time do I have to think about this? I need to get some things in order. I want to, I want to send you this list of equipment that you can start looking. And all of these things that I'm talking about are things that tell them that you're really interested in the job. So don't be bashful about that. That, that phone call, do not be bashful on the phone. Because if you don't have what you need, you're not doing anybody any favors, especially the institution who's just invested a lot of time and money in you. Advisement. If there's any way that you can get out of advisement at least the first year, if not the rest of your life, do it. <laughs> most places, at least most research institutions, when it comes to advising, if it's not a graduate student or an undergraduate student who's doing a research project with you, the advisement is really meaningless. You may be advising 100 students a semester signing off on their paperwork and making sure they're not going to flunk out. But when it comes to tenure and promotion, it doesn't count much. But it's a lot of time. So think about advisement. When you go back to your second interview or even your first interview, ask the other faculty, don't ask the administrators like me. You want the truth. Talk to the faculty and ask them what their advisement load is. Do they expect to just advise their doctoral students? Do they have master's students? Do they have to advise undergraduate students? If so, how many? And again, you know, if you negotiate out of teaching, negotiate out of advising at least the first year. <clears throat> Service. You need to know what service means, because service means different things at different places. If you're at a teaching institution, it's mostly going to be service within the department and at the university. They'll stick you on faculty set where you sit there reading a book when everybody else raises their hand. You raise your hand too. I didn't just say that. Um, you know, it's going to be service within the institution. If you get to a bigger institution, you get to a research institution, Service means service to your scholarly organizations. It means that you serve on committees. You need to be serving on American College of Sports Medicine committees. Are you? We'll work on it. It's doing, it's doing service to your profession. Now, service will take care of itself at the institution. They're going to tell you you're going to be on this committee or that committee. If you can get out of, all right, are we still filming? You're not really going to show that to anybody. No. If there's any way that you can, at least for the first two years, stay off of any committee that has the word curriculum in it, do it. Those are process committees. Those are committees that are going to meet regularly, and they're going to have, you're going to just process stuff to death. And you'll end up sitting there pulling your hair out. And after a year of all this processing, they'll switch two courses. So, you know, if there's any way you stay off curriculum stuff, do it. If it's something that affects you, if it's something like a space committee or a facilities committee or infrastructure, anything about facilities or infrastructure, something like that, those are always good to be. Talk to the other faculty about what committees meet 
irregularly. And there are always committees that never meet at all, but you get to put them on your CV and you get to put them on your annual report. Those are always good. I was once on a committee that didn't meet for four years. I was only on it for three years. They extended me for a year. It never met. So know what service means. Know whether it's within the university. Know whether it is to your profession. You know, things like uh, reviewing manuscripts, doing that kind of stuff is service to your profession. <clears throat> it research, it, it, at least in this place, that's huge. Serving on an editorial board is a big deal. You know, it shows that you're recognized as a professional in your field of study. But again, if you're interested in smaller institutions, it's mostly going to be service on committees and those kinds of things within the institution. But know what that mix is. It's okay to say no. Don't say no all the time. But especially the female students and underrepresented minority students, you will get asked to be on all kinds of committees. My brother, who's a professor at Texas A&M, had a stroke a few years ago. And he was, and I told him this was going to happen. He's not an administrator, he doesn't like administrators. He likes to work. I told him, you're going to get inundated with university requests to serve on committees. And he didn't, he didn't think I was being serious until he told me later. He said he had been invited to be on just about every university level committee there was after the stroke. These people didn't know his name before that stroke. So, you know, if you're, if you're an underrepresented or a female student and you take a faculty position, expect that you're going to be asked to be on a lot of committees. You're not doing yourself any favor by saying, you know, it's really important to have representation. I need to do yourself a favor and say no. And talk to your chair about this. Ask your chair, am I doing enough service? My guess is your chair will say yes, unless it's departmental service. <clears throat> Other things to negotiate for, summer salary. Number one, know how you get paid. There are full professors that I talk to pretty much on an annual basis who still don't know how they get paid summer salary. And some of them have been here for over 20 years. You know, what you often hear is that summer salary is one third of your nine month appointment. It is not anywhere. It is off a daily rate. Yeah, you know, so you've never heard that. You've all heard this one third business. They will pay you one-third. If, if you write a grant, you can pay yourself one-third. If you do, you're losing money. Because if you actually take your nine-month, every work day for that nine-month period, this is what the universities do. You take that, you count the number of work days, you divide your salary into that, that is your daily pay rate. Then you take your summer salary, and you look at how many work days there are, and you multiply it by that daily rate. That is what you can ask for for summer salary. That is the max amount you can ask for. Know how your salary gets paid. Know how it's calculated. If you do the one third and then you compare it, and you can do it here. Look at the look at the calendar for USC for the last year. If you look at that daily rate and do that multiplication, you lose a boatload of money if you do that one third business. But we still have full professors here who think they get paid a third of their money. Most institute yeah. are you guaranteed a summer salary? Only if you negotiate. And no, you know, a lot of people will take jobs and they'll say, well, you know, you're supposed to teach in the summer. Okay, is that, is that how I get paid? Sure. How much do I get paid per course? Seven and a half percent of your nine month salary. So, seven and a half percent of your nine month salary, how many courses do you have to teach in the summer to make up your whole summer salary? At least four. Summer courses are almost every day, right? You guys teach two courses each semester in the summer, and you won't be doing any research. You'll be in class all day, every day. And guess what happens to research productivity? That's right. If you're in your postdoc right now, enjoy it. It's the best time of your life. I know old, old guys told me that, and I laughed at them, just like you just laughed at me. 20 years from now. Look back. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to end up teaching in the summer, know how much you can get paid per course. And most, most places don't distinguish between three and four hour courses. They, they pay you seven and a half percent regardless of whether you're teaching a one hour class, a two hour class, or a four hour class. So know that too. But most places that are larger institutions, smaller institutions won't do this because your job is teaching, they expect you to teach. 
Most places, at least the bigger institutions that are expecting research productivity, will pay at least one summer for you. They'll cover you for your first summer. Some places will pay you two summers. If it's a private school, you may squeeze three out. And if you don't ask, you don't know. But I would certainly ask, is there any way that I can get at least two or three a three summer for me? And most bigger institutions will do that. Yeah? Uh, when do you ask for this? In the second interview, correct? This is this is after you go back. This is after you've been offered the job and you've gone back. That's the point where you are you have the highest leverage that you're ever going to have until you win your Nobel Prize. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, at that point they want you. They've invested a lot of time and money in you, and that's when you have leverage. The minute you say yes and you walk onto that campus, you're just a lowly little assistant professor. But until you say yes and walk on that campus, you're the ball game. They want you. And they've invested time and money in you. And I tell you right now, the chairs of search committees do not like to hear, and I'm one of the worst, do not like to hear that they recommended you for a job and then some administrator screwed it up. You know? After you've been on a search committee, you've done all the work, and you've got a good person, and they screw it up because they won't give what they want, then go over it. So you have leverage. You're, you're in the catbird seat at that point. Until you get an offer, they've got the power, and you're just hoping. You know, the minute they make you the offer, it's switched. They want, they've made you an offer, now it's your decision whether you're going to do it. And they want to make you do it. They'll give you pretty much what they can afford to give you. They can't give you the moon, you know, but depending on the institution, they can give you an awful lot, if not, if not all the way. But again, you can't be bashful. Summer salary is a big deal. Uh, there are people who come that don't have summer salary. They think they get paid summer salary. They don't know if they're, they're on nine month, 10 and a half, 11 or 12 month appointments. And different people in this institution on different ones. If you're at a medical institution, it's going to be 12 months or 11 months every time. Most state institutions, most land grant universities are nine months. So you've got to come up with the summer salary. If they can't give you a whole summer salary, ask them if they can give you half summer salary. And point out to them that if you're teaching all summer, that you're not doing research, you're not being productive from a research perspective. They're not stupid, they know that. So these are things to negotiate for. Uh, research and teaching assistance. That's another negotiating point. It's not unusual at all to say, can you cover a doctoral student for the first three years until I can get up and run it? If it's a master's level institution, can I have a master's student or two that are paid for? And the key part of that is paid for, that they're covering the student. So this is an investment in you as a faculty member and your productivity. And if you're going to kind of go to an institution like this one, I would at least ask for a doctoral student for three years. At least one doctoral student. If it's a master's institution, I would ask for two master's students for three years or until they graduate. Travel allowance. You're probably not going to have, unless you hit on a grant or you go there with a grant, you're not going to have any money to get to meetings. You don't want to pay for that out of your pocket. Many institutions, many departments will already have a travel allowance. Most departments I know of have $1,000 a year per faculty member that they're given to travel. Ask for more. And these are things, talk to the faculty when you go visit. Is there, you know, when you talk to the assistant professors or the associates, again, don't ask people like me. Say, is there a travel allowance? If they say it's $1,000, make note of that. When you're negotiating, ask for 2000 Worst thing they can do is say, we really don't have that, but we do give you a thousand. So you haven't really lost by this. <laughs> Travel allowance is a big deal. You know, you want to present your work, you've got posters, you have students who want to get someplace, and if you don't have any money, it's miserable paying, paying for your own trips at home. Especially when you're just getting started. <laughs> Ask about grant support and grants management. And this is something I deal with all the time. New faculty come in, they're writing grants. They don't really know how to write grants. They don't have anybody there to help them. 
They don't have anybody there who's looking at their specific aims and going, don't bother because this isn't fundable, or this is great, but you need to do this instead. You know? So getting grants out the door, know, know the process and know the support you're going to have getting grants out the door. And also know what post-award looks like. Who's going to help you manage this grant when you get one? And I will tell you, if you're teaching, writing grants, running a lab, advising students, doing service, if you're doing all those things, you will go to bed at night with a knot in your stomach every night being afraid you run out of money if you don't have somebody helping you manage the grants. And I'm saying that from first-hand experience. You know, I spent many years worrying about money and then finally got enough money to hire a post-award person and I have slept like a baby ever since. And she just tells me, you know, you run out of money here, I'm moving something from this grant over this grant, it's great. So know how that works. And if you're in an institution that is a research institution that doesn't have pre- or post-award support, that should be a red flag for you. That means you're going to be on your own, and that's not a good situation. All of these things that I'm telling you are negotiating tools and negotiating points that can be mixed and matched. If they, don't, if they tell you that I can't meet the salary that you're asking for, if you're saying, you know, I know the assistant professor, the, the, the mean assistant professor's salary nationwide for my field is this, and this is what I'm asking for, which is a legitimate ask. You may be at an institution that says, I simply can't pay that. Now, they're probably not going to tell you it's because it's what the senior assistant professors made, and they're going to get taken out and burned in effigy if they bring you in at a higher salary. But if they say, I just can't do that, then say, okay, can you do this instead? Can you pay half my summer salary for a third year? Can you pay for a doctoral student for a third year or a fourth year? Can you increase my, my travel allowance? What about moving expenses? Can you pay my moving expenses? I'll tell you the trick to moving expenses. What they typically do, if you can negotiate this, they can't give you, if it's a state institution, they can't pay your moving ex expenses, but they can back hire you for a month. So if you're going to start August 15th, they will actually back hire you to July 15th, and you can use that money for moving expenses. So there are ways to get money like that that you can negotiate. So don't think because the salary isn't as high as you wanted it to be, there aren't other things you can do. Am I done? Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you want to take some questions I, I real will, quick? Hey, I'll stay here for the next 30 minutes if you want to. <clears throat> or, if anyone needs to go, you're welcome to go. Um, and now let's just do kind of Q&A. How about that? Right. Yeah. You said, you said you were going to talk a little bit about how to for that offer in writing after you've had your phone interview and they're, yeah. they're interested in when, when you get to, when you when he when he or she whoever makes you an offer mm -hmm. on that first call say well let's talk about that usually what they'll say is you know we want to hire you in at a nine month appointment at this salary we think and your response is going to be something to the effect of well there's some other things that can we talk about but first of all I'd really like to come back you know, you want to show enthusiasm for the job. Even if the salary, just you fall off your chair because it's so low. You still want to come back. Because they're, they're going to lowball you. Mm -hmm. So you want to go back, so you ask for that. If they don't want you to come back, that's a, that's a big red flag. You know, uh, most people will bring you back. You know, that's when you start asking people these questions. In the meantime, tell the person, I have this list of equipment and supplies that I would need to get started. Can I send it to you and have you have somebody look around to see what's already there? Because I don't want to try and ask you for money to, to buy something that's already there. They'll love that. And so that gives them something to do while you're getting your plane tickets to go visit. So you go visit, you, 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 know, you talk to people, you get a list of all these things I've talked about, and then you say, I'm very excited about this, let me go home and put all this stuff together. And then you send them an ask email. You say, this is what I would like to have to accept this position. And they will come back with, you're insane, go away. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but they will come back and they'll say, this is what we can do. When they come back with, this is what we can do, you're back to having an official offer. When you send them the email, that's not an offer. 
Their offer is still on the table, which was nine months this south. Now you ask for new things. If they write back and say, this is what we can do, all of a sudden you've got a second official offer. <laughs> don't, don't go back and forth too much. Don't do more than two asks, or you'll start irritating people. And after the second ask, if you still are hesitant, if you say, well, can I have a week or two to think about it, everybody at that institution is going to start rethinking whether they want you or not. You know? And you don't want to walk in the door with people disliking you before you get back there. <coughs> so you make an ask, and you say, this is what I'd like to have. And then when they write back, they'll say, this is what I can do. And there's your offer. And that's probably as good an offer as you can do. Don't, don't go back again unless there's absolutely something that you have to have that they, you know, if, if it's gonna if it's gonna jeopardize your career, go back with a second offer and say, you know, I simply have to have this to be productive, and here's why. But you know, be reasonable, be enthusiastic. If you turn down the job, be enthusiastic turning down the job. So you know, this is a great opportunity, it's just I just don't think it's gonna work for me, you know. Here's why. If you've got a spouse, you can always blame it on your spouse. That's what everybody does. Yeah. I mean, they do. Yeah. You know, well, my husband didn't want to move, or you know, my kids are in school. You know, which they could have told you three months earlier. That, was, right? But that—that's how you ask. And you, oh, you know, you don't want to make enemies because it's a small world. And even if you don't go there, you're going to see these people at meetings. They're going to get phone calls occasionally. Hey, you know, so and so, he's applied for a job. You know, you want people to like you because it really is a small. So that's how you answer. Yeah. What if you have the good fortune of being offered two positions? How does that change the negotiation process? Um, <clears throat> if you already have, there are two situations. One is that you have an offer, and you're waiting for an offer that you're more interested in. And then there's I have two offers. The I have two offers is easy, right? You negotiate for both of them, and then you pick out whichever one. You go, you visit both, and do the whole process. First. Unless, unless you have already re really decided, there's nothing unethical or inappropriate about you going to visit. Look, you're trying to make up your mind, and they both want you. Mm -hmm. If you have an offer you're waiting on that you really are more interested in, <clears throat> that's kind of tricky, and a lot of people will say it's your responsibility to tell them that there's another offer that you would like to see before you make a decision. Um, they're not going to like it. They will like your honesty, but they won't like that. Yeah. So that's really a kind of a personal thing. Um, I would stall. I would I would say, can I come back for a second visit and then tell them I can't get there for two weeks? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would I would, I would I would do that. I would do those kind of things. You know? I'm not sure I would really tell them that I'm waiting on another offer. A lot of people do, but I've chaired search committees. <clears throat> where somebody said, you know, there's another offer that I'm really waiting on. And, and I can't in good conscience say yes to this one. And then it comes down to, well, you know, either we want you badly enough that we'll wait, or, you know, we just can't wait and we need to move. But that's really more of a personal decision. If you, if you really are going to say no, if you've got two offers and you're going to say no to one of them, don't go back. Don't, don't waste their time. I think that's it. Uh, the spousal hiring, like if, if you have a spouse that works in the same career as you exactly, like you know, she is PhD student in the same area or interested in, and she's doing research and everything, and you're moving to another university, and she will have to move with you. You married somebody who does exactly the same thing you do? <laughs> no, I guess. <laughs> no. I should have talked to you years ago. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's negotiation. There are some institutions that would say no. There are some institutions that wouldn't have any problem with it at all. And then there are some institutions, do you guys work together? Uh, we do. We're okay, the same so research group. But I'm a postdoc. She's too. Um, a lot of times, it is, well, first of all, you tell them that up front. Because a lot of times, you know, if it's a field that, that's multidisciplinary, she could be in another department. If she's going to actually work with you, if you guys are going to work together as a research team, which happens a lot, you know, that's something you negotiate for up front. Knowing 
that one person is going to get a better deal than the other person. Right? Because if, you, if you've negotiated hard, hard for yourself, it's unlikely that they're going to be able to create a position that has the same hiring package. <coughs> it's just economics. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to dissuade you from doing that, but you know that's something you need to tell them up front. That I, I have a traveling, a trailing spouse. That she works in the same field. What can we do? And it may be that they put her in a different department in the same unit. You know, it, depending on the institution, they may say that's fine. A lot of institutions are hesitant to put married couples in the same department, both tenure track. And I'll tell you the reason for that, because if you decide to leave and take another job, they've just lost two tenure track faculty. And that's the reason people are hesitant to do it. It's not for any other reason other than there's a risk. But again, that's something you talk about up front. You know, when you're doing that first phone interview and they say, are there any other circumstances we need to know about, which is something they should ask. You need to say, here's something that I'm concerned about. <coughs> but if they don't ask, I don't say until I get a real interview, like a site interview. Yeah, I would wait till I got there. You know, yeah. If they don't ask, wait till you get there. Charm them, right? Once, you, once they meet your charming self, and they'll do anything to get you there. Yeah. Um, so you said that you should always negotiate for a higher salary. Uh, my problem is I find it a little bit gauche to you know talk about money. So what's the best way to just approach this, being straightforward but not you know just grabbing money out of them? Well, you're not. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna know what the national average is for your field. You're gonna know what the typical promotion salary is, you're going to know what it is per region of the United States. There's nothing wrong with saying, you know, that you're you're offering me six thousand dollars less than the average for the southeastern United States. I was really hoping to get that average, you know, at least that average. And, and if they offer you the average, should you just take it or should you try to don't go back and negotiate. No, don't do no, that. No, no, if they offer you this average like straight up, let's say the average for South Carolina is eighty thousand and they come at me with a first offer of eighty thousand. Should I still try to get a higher? You should summary? always ask for more. Okay, and how do I go about doing that? Yeah. Since I'm ask to get higher than average. <laughs> ask for more. Okay. I was written. So yeah. I, I this just is, tell them. Look, for the rest of your career, every salary increase you get is going to be a percentage. If you change jobs and go somewhere else, they're going to know what the average is for your institution for your field, in your department, and they're gonna, they're gonna sit down, you're not gonna know this, but they're gonna sit down and they're gonna say, okay, well, we'll offer him 10% more than the average for his department now. It is critically important that you get the highest salary you can get to start with, because for the rest of your career, it's gonna be percentages. And if you start off low, if you've got one person who's making 40, starts at 40,000, and somebody else who starts at 80,000, probably won't happen, easy, easy numbers, you know? A $2,000 increase for both of those people the next year, this person got a twice as big increase as this person. It's important for you to come back and ask for more. They're not going to say, we hate you and we don't want you to come because you asked for more money. They expect you to ask for more money. So I would be shocked if someone didn't ask for more money. So how do you phrase it if you are at the average? So how do you ask for a bonus? You don't bring up the average. You bring up something else. Okay. You know, I mean, you use the average. If, if you got to use things to your advantage. If, you know, if you're lower than the average, you say the average. If you are the average, you say, "Well, I was really hoping for this because I'm making this much now, and I was really looking for at least this big an inch." You know, you find a way. Okay. Be creative. I have a question about family leave. Yeah. So, um, obviously, their policies are generally posted on the internet, and then if you meet with HR, I'm sure they would tell you again but you know a lot of times there's negotiation power within like once a faculty member finds out they're expecting you know then they meet with their chair are should you negotiate for any of that before you're even pregnant like when you're starting your job negotiating for what in terms of like you know if if, if there's like variance in terms of leave like you could either teach zero courses or one course the semester you have a baby like 
should you go in there and say, I'm not teaching any courses? What, what you need to ask HR about is stopping the tenure floor. They, institutions can't negotiate with you individually for leave time. Okay. But what they can do is talk to you about stopping the clock. Most places, because of medical leave, because of family issues like that, you can stop the tenure clock, which is, and you can't do it retroactively. Right. So you need to know, you know, if I need to stop the tenure clock, if I were to get pregnant and I was going to take leave or if something happened, you know, is there a process to stop the tenure clock? Okay. Now, what we have happen quite often is someone doesn't stop the tenure clock and then comes back at tenure and promotion time when things are iffy and says, well, you know, we had to miss eight months because we had this child that was sick and, blah, blah, blah. and that doesn't usually go well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, know the policies for stopping the tenure clock. And those, that's usually in the faculty manual. Mm -hmm. Most faculty manuals are online. Read it. Most faculty never do. But yeah, institutions usually can't individually negotiate with each faculty member leave time. I mean, that's usually a university. So and oftentimes a state. <clears throat> okay. Great. This has been great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamlin. If you haven't signed in, please sign in. I'm not sure where the sign-in sheet. Uh, and help yourself to if there's any food left over. Can we get an announcement? Yes. Um, I have some postcards for an event tomorrow at Adventure. It's tomorrow night. It's a networking event for adults. Um, there'll be food, laser tag, manicure for the ladies. I'll leave them on the table.